What's up guys, uh, this is a video for determining what the uh, best leader for each color is. Uh, I developed sort of like an objective measurement of how to do so. Uh, I know there's always a lot of like uh, conversations about this on the uh, the main group and uh, there's never been a way to uh, accurately determine uh, what the best leader for each color is. Uh, a lot of people are interested in this uh, particular segment because or this particular conversation is because uh, each color has kind of like a unique identity for each of the color and each of the identity allows you to explore uh, different strategies uh, per color. Uh, but in the competition, I don't know why it's so important, but in a competition, it's about what's the best leader not the best leader per color but I digress if this was a way if there was a way to do uh, the best uh, the best color or the best leader per color this would be the way to do it um, so uh, using a power level uh, scouter is probably not going to be uh, invented anytime soon so we have to use uh, other ways such as a point system and a point system is how I'm going to introduce this so one big criteria I don't use uh, to assess whether a leader is good, and this is a big one, and a lot of people do this, is uh, I don't use events. Uh, events is a good, fast way to determine what a good leader is per color. Uh, however, there are so many things that can go wrong with using that uh, measurement, and I know uh, this is probably going to be a shocker to you guys, but um, if, uh, if a deck top before, um, that means that uh, people know about it, and if people know about it, uh, people can play test against it, and side deck against it, and play differently against it. Uh, that's kind of the general idea here. And so I never use these as a measurement to determine what uh, a leader, how if a leader is good per, for its color. Uh, another one is that it, it could be very highly represented. So an example I like to use is if uh, you're drawing straws, right? And uh, the straws is comprised of uh, yes and no's, right? But the let's say that you are drawing straws out of the out of the uh, the pool of uh, straws you can get out of, and like ten of them, ten out of the twelve are like yeses, and then two out of the uh, two out of the uh, twelve are nos. If you draw straws and you have more straws in the pool, you're you're more likely to have uh, you're more likely to pull a yes out of the uh, the straw the the band of straws. So that's why I don't use uh, topping an event as a measurement because uh, theoretically you can have 12, let's say, Gogetas, right? And you have, sorry, you can have 10 Gogetas in a pool and two uh, non decks. If, uh, if a Gogeta tops uh, a top 8, uh, so let's say for that a specific event, uh, that uh, deck uh, tops, right? Let's say Gogeta tops. Would it be, would it be a, a merit? Uh, for that particular deck to uh, to win that event, uh, despite having uh, ten of them in the top tables, no, it wouldn't be right. Uh, it's very intuitive to see it that way because you can see that the the numbers uh, basically support a probabilistic cause where uh, the Gogeta deck would uh, to basically top in that event. So I don't use that. Uh, that's why I don't use uh, topping an event as a uh, serious uh, way to consider if the deck's good or not. Uh, and another one is that if a uh, deck top, and it was a rogue deck, right? A rogue deck is typically classified as a deck where a lot of people don't know about it, that strategy and how it works, right? So if a lot of people don't know how to beat that deck because it was a rogue pick, um, you're gonna have they're gonna have a lot of good time or people don't know what to uh, to play around or how to play around it or side deck against it. If the deck is a rogue pick, then what, what it essentially happens is uh, the rogue player gets to basically get a free pass every round and uh, essentially get a lot of wins, uh, hoping to run into players who don't know how the deck works. But once the deck tops, right, then people know about it and then we go into the situation where people know how to play against it and then that deck won't probably top again. Uh, that's why I don't believe that uh, if a rogue deck tops, it's considered a good color, a good leader for that color. Uh, and then another one is uh, that uh, let's say you're playing a specific deck and it lo hard loses to a certain matchup, right? Let's say you're playing against a you're playing a blue deck and you get uh, you don't get matched up against any hand destruction deck, right? All the way through. Well, technically. You could theoretically dodge all your bad matchups and have all your good matchups, right? 
and so I would never use an event to justify whether a deck is good because uh, if a deck is good because it dodges all its bad matchups can you say that deck is good right that's why I don't use topping an event as a way of doing it uh, and then uh, we run into this uh, fallacy that I created uh, fallacy is just a, basically a fancy way of saying that uh, it fails to demonstrate. Uh, so, like, if you're making a claim that a deck is good because it did it uh, did well in an event, well, you're creating sort of a fallacy where you're failing to demonstrate why it's good, right? Topping an event uh, can be a good merit to some to, to a lot of people because it shows the performance of the player, not the deck. But it doesn't demonstrate why the deck is good. Um, you have to basically demonstrate it through using reasons. Uh, reasons such as uh, it has uh, uh, strong battle cards that no other leader can use. It has an uh, uh, access tool uh, to us to a lot of good strategies that other decks can't use. Those are reasons that you can use to demonstrate why uh, a deck is good for its specific color. But you can't say that it's good because it topped. It's a very lazy but also non-demonstrative uh, de way of uh, showing why uh, your deck is good. So uh, I'm going to show you an objective way to pretty much gauge whether a uh, leader is good for its color, even though it's not as important as uh, you might think. Uh, when you're doing competitions to determine what a uh, the best leader for each color is, uh, it's best not to use uh, topping events as a way to demonstrate it. It's better to use reasons. Um, so anyways, uh, let's go on. So the objective way that I use our criteria and that you should use too is uh, are these are these specific reasons? Uh, the first uh, criteria that I use to determine this is the leader has to be able to awaken fast and on its own. And I put the own on a uh, quotation. And the reason why I do this is because not every leader uh, has an alternative awakening condition that is uh, that is going to happen without its battle cards. Uh, and a good example of these is Trunks and uh, Sun and the Gogeta leader on the front side. Uh, they both have the ability to self-awaken itself if the conditions are met. And those conditions are pretty generally easy to do, right? Uh, for Trunks, it's just you just have to have uh, two or more energy, and you just have to have a Vegeta, uh, a yellow Vegeta in the battle area. And all you have to do is slip that Vegeta underneath that leader, and then spam, you're awakened, right? If you're playing. Uh, a lot of Vegeta's in your deck, uh, and you also have cards that fetch Vegeta from the deck, such as Trunks, right, uh, and Bulma. Uh, you can have a lot of ways to self-awaken, and that's why I mean I have quotation uh, own because uh, technically, if you're being uh, specific about it, Trunks doesn't awaken on its own. It requires Vegeta, a battle card, but it requires a card that it's very easy to play out of your your deck and plus this deck has this game has a mulligan system so you're definitely going to see uh well if you're going to have a very high probability of seeing uh vegeta out of your uh, out of your deck because there's so many ways to get it. so that's why i quotation mark own because it's not technically own there's other ways to do so uh and the gogeta the the front side of the gogeta ability uh you just have to have a goku and a vegeta and then your z energy and since the the leader on the front side has a way to basically look at the top three cards of your deck for any any red saiyan uh this basically allows you to see your gokus and vegeta especially since your whole deck is comprised of uh gokus and vegetas from the gt series so uh that's a criteria that i use to determine whether a leader is good good or not uh being awakened why so why is it so important to awaken that's the the key fundamental difference is that if your leader, if you're playing cards that help you awaken, right, um, such as uh, Saiyan Kaba, which takes life, any card that basically takes a life on a swing or activate main, uh, you have to basically take uh, out uh, cards out of your deck space to play those cards. And so cards that don't really need to uh, incorporate the awakening aids, as I call them, uh, on the next slide, uh, I'll just basically show you. Any card that has to incorporate these cards in their uh, in their main deck in order to awaken uh, inherently has a flaw in it because now, uh, if you draw these cards when you're already awakened, right? And that's not including the uh, the the Vegeta here on the right side here. 
Uh, that's not including this guy, but if you have to play these cards in your in your deck to awaken, then you're you've, you're doing your deck a uh, disservice because now after you've awakened and you draw into these guys, uh, you now have a diminishing value. Uh, meaning that uh, they were valuable at one point of the game, or the early points of the game, but not so great after you draw into it. At best, they're basically a 5k combo. So to go back here, uh, having more space in your deck to uh, out certain situations uh, is definitely a better than a deck that has to play Awakening 8s, is basically my uh, my reason for being able to self-awaken on some. Uh, the other one is being able to have a higher stat uh, at an earlier game, right? Theoretically, you can think of, the, of, of it this way. If your leader is already on the backside at the beginning of the game, let's say uh, at the beginning of the game, your leader is already on the backside, would that be more preferable than having a leader that is on the front side it has to find a way to self-awaken to get to a higher base debt right that's that's the thought experiment i'm going to propose here and obviously the, the the answer to that is obviously most people are going to prefer the leader to be already awakened on the front side already right so that means you having a higher base stat is technically the reason why you want to be awakened that means that uh, you have to combo less on defense if your opponent's attacking you for 10 if you're uh, if they're attacking you with battle cards that are 10k like uh, a storm used to do right you want to be on the backside so you can preserve your hand size uh, so they don't combo so high right or if uh, if you're attacking with your 15k leader your opponent is most likely going to take it if it, they're still on the front side right because 15k you have to combo out two cards out of your hand that are 5k's just to get out of it so uh, definitely a, a plus to be able to awaken on your front side uh, as quickly as possible now that doesn't really apply to every situation right because uh, sometimes on the back side the stats are the same as the front side right or uh, or if the leader's ability is better on the front side in terms of being able to generate advantage uh, rather than the back side. Uh, and I think a good example of this is all the surge leaders. All the surge leaders on the back side, uh, all the generational advantages uh, are very much uh, temporary. So uh, it just really, you just have to, you just have to be able to uh, how do I say this? Take it case by case. Uh, this is not always a, uh, the rule, but it's definitely a good rule of thumb. So uh, just take that with a grain of salt. Uh, and then the other one is being able to access backside abilities. Uh, a lot of the backside abilities are very useful, uh, being able to generate advantage. Uh, trunks, and uh, I'll just use the two examples on the screen here. Uh, trunks here. Uh, on the backside, uh, can generate a lot of advantages because it revives a one drop from the drop area on a swing, and the, the one drop isn't having the skills negated, it generates an advantage on its own. So, being able to generate a plus one on swinging, uh, another plus one by playing a battle card on rest mode, of course, that generates you an advantage, and also generating a uh, also generating a card draw on the EX Evolve is another one, right? So access to the backside ability uh, that is very, very, uh, well, how do I say this, generates a ton of advantage is typically why I consider uh, this a big criteria in uh, being able to awaken fast because the backside abilities are often more, way more powerful than the frontside abilities. So that's why I consider that. Uh, and then that's basically it uh, for generating uh, advantages on its own, uh, being able to awaken fast. Uh, so let's go on to the next one. Uh, the next one is, can your deck draw random cards or search specific side deck cards? Right, so uh, the, I don't think there's a specific leader currently that can search for specific side deck cards. I know if you're playing like, uh, the Goten from the draft box series that searches for any of the yellow extra cards that yeah it has the ability to do so uh, that that's a specific leader uh, but most of the time most leaders can't search for specific side deck cards that are impactful in the in the mirror matches or any any of certain matchups but is your deck being able to draw a lot of cards uh, even though it's not generating you a net advantage and so I'm going to use the Trunks Gita uh, example in the Gogeta matchups uh, so the Trunks Gita allows you to draw pretty much a, a lot of cards out of your deck, right? And since you're playing a yellow deck, sometimes you want to have access to uh, Vegeta's Final Flash, Release from Evil, uh, Token Negates, Boss Monsters, you name it, right? 
and pl being able to draw random cards for every situation is very vital to the deck strategy because if you're citing if you're citing cards such as release from evil uh, against matchups that basically lose to release from evil such as uh, the gamma the gamma matchup where they swing with the leader if you activate release from evil from the on that swing right and they tapped out they suddenly can't have the ability to uh, quote unquote restand the energy because your leader was able to generate a lot of advantages uh, being able to see release from evil and so your side deck doesn't have to side deck so many of the copies of release from evil in your 15 cards and you'll also be able to draw them more, more likely if you uh, are able to draw uh, cards from your from your deck from ex evolving and attacking and uh, playing vegeta or trunks from the, the drop area to draw cards uh, the same way with gogeta as well that's why you see these decks consistently top and i'm not using that as an indicator of uh, why the deck is good i'm just basically saying uh the results speak for themselves uh in terms of uh why the leader is good it's because they're able to draw a lot into to the sideboard as well so uh, this means that uh you basically um mean that you use a lot less space for your side deck and you can side deck a lot less cards so you don't have to take out cards on your deck so much and also being able to draw into all your good cards just to reiterate so that is the criteria that i use is if your deck can draw random cards and uh a lot of it so that you can fix your hand for every situation um so another uh, uh this is this is still within the same criteria by the way so a lot of the uh abilities to hand fix uh without generating an advantage is discarding cards and or destroying cards out of your your board in order to generate you two new cards out of your deck right that doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting a net positive right so if you're discarding a card and you're drawing two you're net positiving one but you're able to see two cards more out of your deck right so this is basically hand fixing in its in its uh in essence because uh you're drawing two other cards which means two other cards you get uh, that are able to deal with a specific situation potentially right you're increasing your sample size for all your statistics major uh to be able to see the cards that you need for a specific situation even though you're not getting a net advantage uh, like Frieza, Gold Frieza on the left side here, you have to give up a, uh, a one drop out of your uh, your board to draw the extra card, right? Your leader swings and you draw an extra card, right? And also your the one drops that you play, uh, you're gener you're be able to uh, draw a card on top of that, right? For Gold Frieza, bad example because your one drops are drawing you a card, right? So you're netting a plus two, even though you're losing a battle card. Uh, but for other scenarios such as the the quote unquote hell coup, uh, you're discarding a uh, you're you're putting a card on top of the deck after you draw two, right? So this means that uh, you're drawing two new cards, but you're putting you're losing one card in your hand, so you're only netting plus one, right? You're only netting a plus one in terms of net advantage, but you're able to see two new, two different cards. Um, and then Piccolo is another one, right? Where you discard a Namekian from your hand to draw, uh, and then you're drawing two. So you only net advantage one card, but you're seeing two new cards. So you're hand fixing. So definitely consider that when assessing uh, whether the leader is able to uh, see new options. So that is why I think it's a big criteria. Um, here's another one, right? Uh, your leader is able to search out or play certain your your deck's key strategies, right? So I'll give an example on the right side here. Your Vegeta leader or your Vegeta and Goku leader is able to play the Spirit Bomb out of your deck. <laughs> uh, that's pretty good, right? So uh, being able to play a key part of your deck strategy uh, just by simply being awakened is a, a vital part of consistency. Now granted, your leader, uh, your Spirit Bomb might be in your, your life and you can't see it out. That's fine, that's a stipulation. That's more of a caveat, right? But, but for the majority of the part, your deck's able to search for the uh, or play the spirit bomb not only search it but play it right for free uh that's kind of the idea here for consistency um Turles, uh plays uh even on the if you just play the leader on the front side it plays the tree of might on your opponent's side the second the game starts right there's no there's no uh there's no way to stop that strategy from being implemented and it's very consistent in, in being able to generate that that tree of might, which uh, allows you to see your uh, your fruit, the uh, the tree. 
because this allows you to search for the the fruit of uh, the fruit uh, from the get go, and that gives you double strike and 15k plus for one energy. That's pretty much your key strategy uh, for Turles. And then there's a uh, there's also the U7 right, um, being able to mill a ton of cards to your drop area, uh, and then being able to spark in 20 search for anything. This makes it so that you can see your uh, your SER way more consistently because if you mill your SER, your unbridled power. SS, uh, SSB Vegeta, well you can suddenly sparking it and then add it to your hand so that pretty much uh, adds to the consistency of the deck itself. So that's why I think this is a key part or key criteria in determining whether your leader is good for its color. And another one is uh, being able to preserve your hand size in a mainstream or unique ways. Uh, I know that hand size is a very important step in preserving your hand, right? Uh, and I'm sorry, not in preserving your hand, but in winning the game, because if you can preserve your hand size, it means that you can combo higher on attacks. You could essentially play certain cards on curve because you didn't combo it away. Uh, you can do a lot of things uh, preserving your hand size. And so when you are able to preserve your options in your hand, uh, I think that's a better way of uh, playing your leader. And there's a lot of ways to do it in unique ways. Um, the invoker leader, for example, uh, you can discard your uh, your your multicolor extra cards, and then draw a card and go up to 15k, right? If your leader, if your opponent is swinging at you for on the front side, uh, for 10k, and all you have to do is uh, throw away an extra card and then it replaces itself, you've essentially preserved your hand size in that whole interaction, as opposed to comboing away a card or taking life. Uh, and then the multicolor cards themselves, when they are discarded to the drop area, you can just uh, warp it to check the top. Uh, but that's uh, specific to the leader. So this is a very unique way, an example of a unique way it preserves hand size. Um, for every battle it engages in, assuming your leader is swinging, the, it's being swung at for, for 10k, uh, the front side ability allows you to preserve hand size. Uh, Beerus, for example, is another popular way to uh, preserve hand size. And on backside, it's able to combo from the drop area, uh, 10k once per battle, and instead of wasting cards out of your hand to combo out of the attack, you can actually just uh, combo for free a 10k multicolor uh, red red yellow card, and be able to preserve your hand size that way, uh, being able to combo up to 25k, assuming your leader is being uh, swung at for 20k by a battle card or a leader, uh, and then you can just uh, preserve your hand size that way. Uh, the Bulljack's another one, right, where you can combo from your energy. Um, so I, there's multiple ways that uh, decks can do it uniquely. Um, gamma is probably a different way. The way that Gamma preserves its hand size is being able to flood your floodgate your opponent with this Android uh, 13 floodgate. Right? If your opponent wants to swing anymore, they have to take two cards uh, from their hand and put them on the bottom of the deck, uh, or maybe it was discard. I forget. Um, that is that is a way that this leader can preserve his hand size because no longer do they have to worry about your opponent going to the combo step because uh, they're taxing them from attacking. So that is uh, one way it preserves hand size, even though it's very uh, it's unique from the other three that I mentioned. And then Hercule is just basically on par with the others. Uh, all the cards that you combo out of your hand essentially get replaced uh, per battle. Uh, that's the way you can preserve in hand size. Um, so uh, other ways that other decks can uh, preserve hand size is by resting battle cards. Uh, sometimes if your leader is able to play uh, battle cards on their turn and then uh, for free basically, um, then resting battle cards or unisons is definitely a way that you can preserve hand size because now that leader, that unison or battle card is not attacking anymore and so that allows you to basically preserve hand size. Um, and another way that I like to, uh, uh, this is another criteria by the way, is if you can generate an enormous amount of advantage without using net energy for them. Um, so this is a criteria that I use. Uh, so uh, Krillin here on the, the left side here is able to draw on the attack and is also draw at the end of the turn. Uh, just by looking at this leader, it's able to generate a plus two on the back side without even committing any energy. Uh, all it has to do is attack and wait until the end of the turn to do so. Uh, and these are net energies, by the way. I mean, this is net gain. This is not a uh, gross gain. This is a net gain. Uh, it's not you're not trading anything out of your hand to do so. 
you're not discarding a card, you're not putting cards on top of your deck like Helku. You're just generating advantage, uh, pure advantage. Um, Hit is able to do this as well by generating you a, a draw and then also getting a plus five and playing a skillless battle card from your drop area without paying for it. Uh, playing a skillless battle card from your drop area uh, is a plus one. Uh, attacking is a plus one because you draw a card. And then getting a plus five uh, on the swing, meaning that your opponent has to combo higher just to get out of it, is a, another form of a plus one, right? Because if you're hitting harder, your opponent has to combo out, and relatively speaking, that is a way you can uh, uh, basically pay for or, or get a uh, net a net gain in uh, in payment. Uh, and then you have Golden Frieza, which is already mentioned before. You get a plus two basically by playing the battle cards that draw you cards. Uh, so this is why I consider this a good criteria for con to determining whether your leader is good for its color. Uh, but however, we have to make we have to consider that in order for them to get their plus two plus three net advantages uh your leader has to be on the backside, right so the stipulation here is that if your if your leader can't uh self-awaken uh, on its own uh, and i use own as this quotation like i mentioned before then being on the backside uh has to be able to be feasible and if they're on the front side for the majority of the game because they can't self-awaken well, then you have a, uh, a non-feasible way to uh, generate you that advantage. And so uh, earlier I mentioned that hit was a way that you could um, have a criteria for satisfying this criteria. But the stipulation is since it can't awaken on its own, you, can't, you have to exclude hit from this equation, even though it's able to generate an enormous amount of advantage on the backside. Since it can't self-awaken on its own, uh, it creates an inherent flaw. <laughs> So I would exclude a uh, hit from this uh, from this criteria. Uh, and then here's a bigger one. Uh, here's a big category is that uh, your leader is able to access its unique battle cards. Um, being able to access its own battle card stands out above the other leaders of its own color. Um, and that not only being able to access those battle cards, but accessing its skill costs easily or only uniquely. Um, so for Gogeta here, uh, being able to restand your Rush Warrior attack is generally reserved for leaders that are able to combo a lot uh, of cards out of its, uh, basically uh, generate a lot of Z energy. Because the Rush Warrior attack, you have to pay two Z energies to be able to play them. And if you have four other Z energies uh, in, your, uh, in your Z energy, it can restand itself and get double strike. And generally, this particular leader is able to do that very easily while other red leaders cannot. Um, so that's a prime example of why uh, it's able to access its other abilities, um, whereas other red leaders cannot do that. Um, and then for Gotenks, uh, this particular Grim Reaper is only reserved for the, the Gotenks leader because you can't play this Grim Reaper in any other green leader um, because it has, its really, it has a really good ability. Uh, to be able to uh, draw two and pop card and uh, basically float into its uh, uh, basically float into the go ten and the youth uh, the trunks youth from the drop area, so that's definitely why I think that Grim Reaper or Go Tanks leader is one of the better green leaders and uh, Gogeta is one of the better uh, red leaders. But we don't know whether or not they're the best uh, for its um, color yet. Uh, we have to do the objective way of measuring measuring that. And then there's also extra cards that uh, leaders can access uh, that no other color, no other leader of its color can access. Um, SS4 Green can access the um, Goku's Kamehameha Deflection, while the Baby Leader can access the Reve Revenge Big Bang Shot. These are really powerful extra cards that can be played virtually for free. Um, not so much the Revenge, Revenge Big Bang attack, but definitely the Goku uh, Kamehameha. These are strong extra cards that can turn the tide of the game and essentially buy you another turn, which is why I think these are really good. Um, uh, this is a good criteria in being able to uniquely access skill costs or skill cards or card skills that no other leaders can do so. And then we have the, these as well, uh, where uh, leaders have the ability to search for super combos. Uh, or not search, but being able to uh, higher, have a higher probability of getting them. Um, the the Goku here can use this Sparking 20 
to get the Frieza Super Combo. The uh, the yellow uh, Vegito is able to play the Kabuto Kai to search for the uh, Krillin Super Combo, and the Gamma, if it flips um, this randomly from the top of the deck into the energy, at the end of turn you can add these back to your uh, you can add this from your energy back to your hand. And that's kind of a, a good way of uh, looking at it. They have a ease of access um, in being able to do so. Uh, another way you want to, so uh, you have to want to be careful here. Even though your uh, your specific leader that's rogue has uh, access to uh, specific battle cards that no other leader can, it doesn't necessarily mean it's better than the generic support. Um, so here we have an example here where the future chunks has access to this particular uh, battle card that can be paid for two energy um, because it has a cost reduction. Is this so? You have to ask yourself: Is this better than the generic support uh, for its color? Right. All blue leaders have access to uh, Piccolo the Infiltrator. Now, is your unique uh, battle cards better than uh, Piccolo the Infiltrator? And uh, the answer to that is obviously pretty intuitive, is that it is not better because uh, this has dual attack and can get a, generate you a plus one through the pan and another plus one by drawing it and also have the ability to get barrier. Um, and so for this situation, uh, for most situations, Piccolo is obviously the better choice for generic support. And so it, can you say your, your leader is a better blue leader if your if your particular battle cards that you play are not better than generic support, and uh, to that you can you have to say that it's not better because even though you have unique access, the unique access to the uh, battle card isn't better than generic support. In short, uh, here we have another situation where it's not uh, it's better uh, it's better than the Rush Ring Warrior, right? Uh, granted, you do have to wait till you have three energies to play this guy, whereas uh, you can play. Rushing Warrior Vegeta for only uh, for only two energy on turn two, but this one has a dual attack inbuilt into it, and it's also able to do double strike damage for 25k. Uh, so in this case, your unique battle card for the Android 13 deck is kind of better than the Rushing Warrior deck because also you can minus 25k to a battle card when it swings. Um, it also has deflect. Well, but that, the other one has deflect as well. But it also has double strike um, on on swings, so on both swings. Uh, whereas this one only has a double strike on uh, one swing, which is the activate main ability. So uh, you can definitively say that this battle card is better than uh, that. It's uniquely accessible to the Android 13 leader. Is better than the Rush Warrior attack, um, and it's this is a generic support. Um, and then we have cards like uh, Weiss's Capriciousness, which is basically the same as uh, Dorn Potential Unleashed. Um, I mean, it's not the same, but it's uh, equal, right? Uh, being able to negate uh, the attack, but only allowing your opponent to attack twice, is kind of the same as uh, allowing your opponent to attack twice with Dorn Potential because it doesn't negate the attack. And then you both have to pitch one card from both of them. So, and then you're also both able to play them for free. So. In this particular situation, uh, it's basically equal in terms of uh, generic support. So you can't say that it's better in terms of using this criteria uh, back here. Is 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 your leader uniquely able to access it? And also, is your unique access to those cards uh, better than the generic support? And if it's equal, it's not better, so you can't give this as a criteria. So that is why you have to use these as a criteria, and I think that's a, re a good way of doing it. Uh, I know it was very long-winded, but this uh, we're not even done yet. So uh, the other way that your leader has to be able to uniquely access it is, is, is it cheap to do so? Right, we can talk about uh, all these cards uh, being able to uniquely access them, but is it cheap to play them? Right uh, here, we have an example of Majin Buu here, who's able to freely play uh, the, the four-drop Majin Buu from your hand, right, without paying its energy cost. This is a huge uh, swing for in tempo yeah, for this particular leader, it's because you can uniquely do it, but also you can also do it affordably. Um, so being able to play this Majin Buu for free, very good choice and a good criteria. Right, you want to be able to play f uh, free battle cards as much as possible. Granted, that's not technically free. You have to place three non-leader cards from underneath them to play this guy. Fine. Uh, Sin Shenron, you had to, you had to banish six Dragon Balls from your uh, from your your drop area. That's really easy to do. 
Um, so you can play such things as uh, Unfeeling Retribution, uh, literally for no energy. So that's definitely a plus for uh, being able to do it. So is your is your leader able to play them for free or for cheap? Is the criteria that I like to use uh, for determining whether your leader is good. And then the other one is is it easy to access those cards, right? If your leader, if your if your battle cards that you're playing uh, has a hard time coming to your hand because you play such a limited copy to it, right? It's a low probability. Um, and a, an example I like to use is the OG cell chain. Uh, the OG cell chain, you have to draw one of in order to to go through go up the cell chain. And since it has a low probability of uh, achieving it because it's such, there's only one one of copy in your deck, can you say that the even though you have a unique access to it, can you say that uh, it's good if you can't even draw it or if you have a low probability of drawing it? And you can say that's a no. Uh, the access is too conditional, right? So I've used uh, these uh, as an example, even though it seems good on paper. In order to even play these guys from your hand for free, they have to be Z awakened. And so a lot of these decks, uh, you have to wait at three or less life to do so. Uh, for Omega Shenron, you have to uh, also be at three or less life, right? Is your leader able to get to the Z leader easily? And if the answer to that is no, then you can't say that you can play your your battle cards for essentially free when it has to be a specific condition or even an energy total, right? So being too conditional is definitely something you have to consider whether uh, you want to give points for ease of access. Um, and then the last one is whether or not your access can be easily stopped or not. If it doesn't have deflect, right? So like. Let's say uh, these cards don't have deflect in it, right? Then suddenly, even though you have uh, a generic support, you have a, a card that's better than the generic support, uh, or uh, these extra cards don't go to your hand very easily, or Grim Reaper uh, just doesn't have deflect. Let's say protect, pretend it does, doesn't have deflect, right? And it gets easily stopped by every other card in the battle, in the card game, right? such as a tyrannical blow, charismatic villain, dirty burst. If they had don't have deflector barrier, well suddenly even though you have ease of you don't have uh, even though you're able to easy access it, you don't really have a way to uh, re uh, resolve its autos that you really want out of it um, because it does have autos or deflect or whatever it is. So you have to definitely consider that uh, whether or not it's good or not. Um, so ease of access is a very hard thing to achieve. Uh, so you definitely have to look that, take that into consideration. Uh, another one is early access, right? Uh, these are examples of cards that even though your leader can play them uh, uniquely, uh, you have to wait until a specific turn to, to play these guys. Uh, these are all three examples of cards that you have to wait till turn four to play them, right? Even though they're strong and powerful, you have to wait until turn four to play them because uh, these stipulations right here where you have to have four or more energy to play them and your opponent has to have two battle cards in play like these are very specific situations uh, this one you have to have a Goku Zeno and your Vegito in the or not Vegito but Vegeta in the drop area or battle area to be warped and you have the four energy to do so so uh, an example a popular a very good example of why uh, these cards turn wise are not good and then we have here with triumph might uh, you have to wait till turn four and you have to have Gogeta and Vegeta in your hand right so this means that you, your early access is being stifled here where they can't be played uh, earlier enough to where the game starts changing so that's why I consider uh, this as a big criteria is being able to have to be able to play these guys early and here's a good example of how you can play these cards early for their unique battle cards. Um, SSC Thwarting wasn't a unique battle card, uh, but it was a good example of being able to Union Fusion from the warp area uh, freely. And you can do this literally by turn two, one because your front side activate main, you can mill theoretically your, your Goku and your Vegeta. And then literally on turn one, you can go, go in swinging uh, with uh, Thwarting the Dark Empire. 
that's why I consider that a good example of a, a leader that can play battle cards literally on turn one that's unique to them and that literally is better than a lot of uh, battle cards for its class. Uh, so Thor the Dark Empire was limited in one for a reason. Uh, Dark Broly can play its Dark Broly cards literally for one energy. Uh, you can play this for one energy, theoretically. Slip a, a Dragon Ball underneath this one and then play a 30k literally on turn one. So um, it's just better theoretically to play cards on turn one and being able to generate a lot of advantage. Um, and then here's another one, right? Where a lot of the SCRs in today's metagame are very generic in being able to be played by a lot of your, uh, by a lot of leaders of the same color, right? So the the key difference is whether or not your leader can uniquely access a SCR uh, easier than every other uh, other leader, right? Uh, the Cumber leader can be played from the warp area, where if your deck plays a lot of, uh, if your decks your leader is able to mill a lot of cards to the warp such as the Gogeta leader that I mentioned in the front in, in the earlier example, it's able to warp five cards on top of the deck. So obviously that deck can easily uh, make or generate a lot of advantages because uh, it's able to fetch this SCR uh, more quicker and easier than other black leaders that can't do that. Um, and then this one right here, uh, your Android 21, the new Android 21, is able to play uh, this for literally uh, on turn two. If your if your opponent has a lot of uh, energy that they can steal um, on the front side or on the back side, so on the back side of the Android 21, you're able to pay energy on your opponent's side of the field um, using their battle cards, assuming it goes on par with the color, uh, to play this card. Um, so if your deck can do that. So be it. Play. This is a good SCR for the Android 21 leader. And then we have the Sin Shenron here that's able to be fetched because it's a Shadow Dragon. A lot of different decks can look at the top five, seven cards for a Shadow Dragon and then add it to your hand. So if you're playing the uh, Sin Mill deck or the even the Sin, um, the Yellow Sin deck, you can definitely play this card because it's easily fetchable uh, because it's a Shadow Dragon. Um, so that's what it boils down to. Um, and then if your deck is the, another criteria, is your deck able to win in other ways other than beatdown, right? If your deck's able to mill, is it able to burn or it's able to uh, satisfy an alternative win condition? Um, and that's easy in theory. There's a lot of leaders that can uh, have alternative win conditions, but they're not very easy to do. Janemba is one of the easiest ways to uh, essentially win uh, alternatively, by milling your opponent out just by tapping your leader and attacking with it because it forces your opponent to mill two on its swing, right? And that's a very good thing about this leader. And so it definitely gets a point in this criteria. And if you use Zamasu, um, you have to wait until your opponent has eight energy to, to, to do so. And this is an example of a uh, of an alternative win condition that's very hard to do because you're giving your opponent eight energy to, to, to basically do the ability so that you can uh, basically burn them for life. So yeah, I would not give points to Fusumasu because of the uh, hard, uh, of its difficulty in being able to uh, get your opponent to 8 energy. Uh, and then the second to last criteria that I use is, is, is your leader able to hit hard, meaning that uh, does it have the double strike keyword ability or the triple strike keyword ability or the quad strike keyword ability? Um, these abilities allow you to essentially uh, win in the combo step where if they have a high life total or two, um, you're able to combo high on these attacks and then force your opponent to combo with their hand away because if they don't, they essentially lose the game. Right? This is why I consider these as a, a good criteria in determining whether your leader is good or not for its color is uh, being able to hit hard. Um, if it's able to hit hard, then you can uh, essentially combo, uh, force your opponent to combo a lot of cards out of their hand and uh, giving you a, a good net advantage uh, in being able to do so. Uh, and all these leaders are able to do so uh, very, very well. Uh, and then the last criteria that I use is whether uh, what's considered legal or not in the format, right? Um, the Double Strike Champa uh, and the Double Strike uh, East Supreme Kai are all really good cards that were banned recently and so if your leader struggles against uh, decks that can utilize uh, Double Strike Champa or East Supreme Kai right and you 
let's say your leader has to go down to two to be very effective right or being able to even awaken right these are these are very uh, pivotal uh, band cards that if they're banned then suddenly your leader has a chance to shine by them so if the, the ban list actually positively affected your leader uh, then that gives you a point because now the cards are not in, in these uh, the card pool anymore. Is your leader not able to deal with uh, two boo unisons or three or four? Well, if your deck's able to deal with uh, one boo unison but not two, then uh, now your your deck's po positively affected by the ban list. Uh, Secret identity is your deck generating you a lot of tokens. Well, now Secret ban identity is at three now, so now that it's at three. Um, suddenly token negates or even having a lot of tokens doesn't seem so advantageous for you. Uh, so this is be, would be an example of uh, the ban list negatively affecting your deck because now uh, now that Secret Identity is at 3 uh, and you're playing a token deck, well now you don't get that point for that criteria. So that's definitely an example of... Um, this is basically an example of how your deck can be negatively offended, affected by the ban list. Um, and then obviously for my pedantic people out there, uh, to even be considered for the criteria, your deck has to be legal. Uh, your leader has to be legal, and these are all examples of uh, leaders that you can't play for the format. Uh, I won't talk too much about that. Uh, reiterations, just as you, uh, this is all the point system that I like to use for considering the uh, what the objectively best leader is. Is that uh, you'll you'll be using a point system, and if your leader satisfies the, each of these criteria, uh, they'll they'll earn a point. And then for its color, if it has the most amount of points, we can uh, objectively measure that leader as being the best for its color. Um, so you just have to use this point system. And uh, throughout this, uh, so for the entirety, of the uh, just to reiterate. Uh, if I am going to evaluate what the best leader for each color is uh, for each uh, time period, uh, I'm going to be using this as an objective measurement to determine what the uh, the leader, the best leader is. So uh, here are all the ones that you guys can use from here on out if you guys decide to do this on your own. But if you guys want to watch my videos, I'll be generating uh, a video per color. Uh, and then I'll be able to determine what the best leader is per color. So this will be kind of like a series kind of thing uh, that I'll be doing. Um, in the event that there is a tiebreaker, uh, all you have to do is go back to the criteria and make them more difficult. So uh, let's say for the first one here, it self awakens itself. Uh, if the leader is tied for um, being able to self awaken, uh, I'm sorry. If the if two leaders are tied for first place and um, and one of the leaders easier to awaken than the other, then the, definitively we can stop there and say that uh, that leader is better than the other leader, and that would be the first place. Uh, that would be first place in terms of best best leader for that color. So that's how I would do it. Um, if it if they're the same in terms of easiness, you just go to the second criteria, and then the second criteria was can it draw random cards, and if that leader can draw more cards uh, easier than the other leader, or more cards in general in terms of net advantage or just uh, whatever um, then you can use you can definitively say that leader is better than the other one in case they're tied so this is how I would determine what the true color is the true uh, leader of that color is and I hope that you guys uh, will objectively measure um, each uh, each leader by, for the best in its color uh, using this method because I think it's a very useful method. I think it's a very objective measurement that we don't have to rely on hearsay or experience. Uh, we can just uh, use this on a uh, basically a non-experienced way of doing it. We can just use theory to, to apply uh, to the situation and determine what the best leader for that color is. So yeah, I think I've rambled long enough. Uh, this is uh, my way of determining what the best leader for each color is. And uh, thanks for watching and I hope to see you guys from you more soon. Peace.